one weekend a year for the past 20 years. The National Hot Rod Association has been bringing Winston Championship drag racing to Canada, to the province of Quebec, to San Air International Drag Strip outside of Montreal. And even though the U.S. border is only one hour away, the architecture, the food, the language, the flags flying give this event the international flavor it truly deserves. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Evans, and welcome to a windy and weather-threatened Lake Grand National Molson. Now, over the 20 years, Don the Snake Perdome has been particularly popular with this crowd, and not just because of his French surname. He's also been the winningest pro driver with seven funny car titles. Now, this year, everyone looking forward to seeing Don's brand-new top fuel dragster. They saw it yesterday in qualifying. From angles, no one could have anticipated. Don Perdon in an absolutely terrifying over backwards over the wall crash the engine still running spewing fuel as the car stopped but miraculously the snake was okay and into the arms of the safety safari working with me today brock yates and big daddy don garlic don you have unfortunately seen this kind of an incident from inside the cockpit on two occasions well it wasn't quite as bad as the snakes i didn't get over that guardrail like that but i'll tell you it's a terrifying experience when you go up straight into the sky like that, you got no control of the car. Right off the starting line, the front wheels were bouncing as the car struggled to get up on the tire. Suddenly, when it came off of the concrete pad, the clutch hooked up, and it was over. They call this a blowover in uh, hydroplane racing, and it uh, is very similar to the reaction aerodynamically that happens to a speedboat. Don, look how it just peeled the body panels off. Actually, that's good. That slows that blow over down just a little bit on my car the body didn't come off it went over and hit much harder now the wing struts were so strong they prevented the car from going right down on the roll cage instead of roll over in the tires and here the rear tires down are still spinning the engines under power that's because he's got his foot braced against the throttle pedal he's waiting for this tremendous impact he knows it's going to hit something and when it does it is with such force that the chassis right here just accordions that is chrome molly steel the rear tire spinning against the rail pull the car over the rail into the grass and again don perdome survived unscathed one of the most spectacular top fuel incidents ever somewhat shake and perdome was greeted by his family as steve evans was there Don Perdome, wife, Lynn, his daughter, Donna. Don more concerned uh, with their feelings than his own. He's obviously okay. You're all right, Snake? Yeah, I'm all right, Steve. You race a whole career, 25 years, almost incident-free, and in one year, it just, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, I know. It just started to come up on me there, and it was, you know, picked him up a little bit, set him down, and then it really, really came up. I, I don't quite understand it right at the moment. Well, if you stay between the walls, that's one thing. But when it went over the rail, that's when you frightened us, and I'm sure yourself as well. Yeah, I didn't know where I was at, obviously. I mean, I, I thought, oh, no, you know, I grabbed the brake and tried to stop it and everything. But it was just too late. It just went, went over center, and it was over with. This was the third of three major crashes for Dome experience in the past year. The first came in December 89 at Bakersfield, California, when a brand new car during a test was destroyed in a very similar crash, a blowover that uh, fortunately Perdome was able to walk away from uninjured. Then another crash, a major engine fire in Dallas, Texas, destroyed that automobile. Now back in Montreal as the crew cleared away the wreckage, Steve Evans asked him if this would affect his top fuel plan. Not really, Steve. Uh, you know, I made a commitment to uh, to do this, and uh, uh, it was just something that happened. It's just like any race car accident. You know, you you have to evaluate what went on and uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. What's your family saying, Lynn, Donna? Well, you know, it's rough on them. That's that's the problem with a situation like this. They're here, they see it all, and uh, it's tough. But you know, it's I'm sure uh, Foyt, Mario, all those guys, uh, their family's been there too, and they've been in accidents. It's just it's just part of the job, you know. Unfortunately, uh, these things happen. Well, that was yesterday under beautiful blue skies, but today not quite as good as Don Garlitz tells us. Well, Steve. As you can tell by this shot, the other big story here today is the weather. You know, the crews come to Montreal expecting the four qualifying runs to get their cars set up for race day. Well, one of those very important runs was rained out yesterday. So in light of this, I asked Joe Amato's crew chief, Tim Richards, what was his weather strategy today? 
Well, this weather here is always difficult. Uh, it changes quite quickly. And uh, Friday when we came here, the barometer was quite good. The air was pretty decent. And then Saturday, the air got a lot worse. And uh, our Friday run wasn't really up to par. And Saturday was really our first solid run, but it was only one run. Uh, this this track here, the thing I watch in the weather the most is the wind and which way it's coming from because uh, the wind here seems to come down the track quite strong and uh, it can really cause some problems with the uh, front ends going up and things like that. And that, that's really the thing I'm watching today. Right now it's a crosswind and we'll watch it quite close. That's the big thing with the weather here. And so now to bring us up to date on what's already happened in eliminations, here's Brock Yates. Well, Don, as we get ready for second round of pro action here at San Air, really the most unpredictable factor in up here has been the weather. We've had a couple of rain delays, and now the wind has come up pretty gusty. But the weather's nice and clear, and we should have some good racing action. In the first round at Top Fuel, we had a couple of major defeats. Dick LaHaye went down, and Eddie Hill in Fort Worth, Texas, defeated Kenny Bernstein in a very close race. You know, Kenny, you stepped on it, and it didn't go anywhere, really. No, I didn't. It's just a little off. You know, we're still struggling that combination. But Eddie ran good. He ran a 20. That's pretty good today. Indeed. And, you know, sometimes the reaction times you get on your time slips and the fans here are very deceiving. If the car doesn't react to your touch, then uh, you look embarrassed. Oh, yeah. It, it, cars are set up differently. Everybody, you know, sometimes they leave harder, sometimes less. So it all depends. You just got to be there as best you can as a driver and do the best you can. And, you know, we're all in it together, driver and team. In that first round of top fuel action, we had a pair of 510s, Gary Ornsby and Frank Hawley. Ornsby was just a wink slower than Frank, but nonetheless, he is going to face Eddie Hill, the man who took Kenny Bernstein out. Eddie, uh, a little windy, but to generally good conditions. You ran a 520, so you're a little off the pace. you got to find some speed. We need a 10. What we did was we put more mag in it, more blower in it, and a new fresh fuel pump, and the thing sounded great on the jack stands. We'll see what happens on the racetrack. All right, well, we'll be watching. Best of luck. Thank you. It is time right now for round number two of Top Fuel, and let's hope it's not as time-consuming as round number one, which due to rain took two and one-half hours. The conditions are a little bit better now, Don Garland. Yes, they are, but it really throws a wrench into the works on these tees because they've got the car set up for one atmospheric condition, and all of a sudden, here's complete new weather change, and it gives them a fit. In the near lane will be Lori Johns, Corpus Christi, Texas. She has had three NHRA national event victories this season. Her opponent, Chris Karamasini, Chicago, Illinois, has been racing 35 years and has none. Don't think that bothers him a little bit, do you, Doc? Doesn't bother him at all. He loves to race. <laughs> and I tell you what, nobody knows quite how old the man they call a Greek is. Any ideas, you guys? I can tell you that he was a soldier in World War II. <laughs> The story is, at the age 16, the Greek kind of fibbed about his age and got in at the very end of the war. But one thing is for sure, Lori John's mom and dad hadn't even met each other when the Greek first started driving top fuel dragsters. So I suppose it wouldn't be appropriate to make the observation that Lori John's could even be his granddaughter. Is that possible? Yes, sir. It sure could. <laughs> Well, the Greek doesn't drive like a grandpa. He out-qualified Lori Johns here and is sitting on the best car he has enjoyed in a long, long time. Talk about your contrast. The Greek away first. The Greek has got her. The up-and-down season for Lori Johns continues. She either wins or goes out early here in Montreal last weekend, the Spring Nationals, Columbus, Ohio. A stout run by the Greek as we watch Californian Frank Bradley Another veteran of top the old uh, competition getting ready to go against Joe Amato. This could be a good one, uh, Big Daddy Don Garlitz. It sure could. These cars are very equal coming into this round. A 513 for Joe Amato giving him lane choice and a 516 for Frank Bradley. But we must remember that Amato qualified low with a 508. And that means he's got some potential there to step up in this round. So I'm sure that Joe is thinking about that blowover of uh, Don Perdones. Remember his uh, crew chief, Tim Richard, said that they are concerned about the headwind here. And now let's go to Steve with Laurie Johns, who fell to Chris Caramacinos. Well, Laurie, a week ago you were blaming yourself. Not so this week, and the car just wasn't up to Chris's performance. No, he's finally got things going. He's running really good. I don't know, that might even be low ET of this round, but uh, we're going to have to get it here one way or another. Gather it up. Thanks.
obviously disappointed young lady, but still with three major event wins to her credit already this season. As we watch Frank Bradley getting ready to go, and from Santa Rosa, California, his last major victory was at the California Nationals, right near his hometown at Sears Point, California. Joe Amato has won 14 national events, two Winston Championships, wanted so badly to join Don Garlitz and Shirley Muldowney as the only drivers with three. But what, oh, we've got a problem right on the starting line. That's Art Hayward, NHRA's electronics expert. Buster Katz gets in, kicks some pieces away. Art looks disgusted. Buster says, let's race. Steve Gibbs in the foreground as NHRA's competition director. He looks relieved. We're going to have a race, apparently. Some kind of a, just a minor little malfunction there for a second. And it is a motto over Bradley. Whoa, and a motto, Don Garlitz, you're right. That Low ET of the round 507 to a losing 515. I bet that Tim Richards put it back into race after he ran that first round and didn't wheel stay it. Brock, what was the problem at the starting line? Well, Buster Couch, uh, who started four billion of these drag races, and I would imagine that was a little bit of a change for you. Exactly what happened to the equipment? Oh, the pre-stage light. Something's happening to it, and it stayed on. It just hung on. Well, pre-stage just means that you're getting real close to the stage line. Right. So I just... Brought him on into the stage light and let it go. <laughs> Safe uh, to run, I hope. Oh, yeah, it worked out great. Great pass. Good job, Buster, Good job. as usual. <laughs> Thank you, Brock. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> oh, man, what a starter. A less experienced guy might have thought, uh-oh, problems, and shut those cars off on the line. Not Buster Cut. He just solved the problems, along with Art Hayward there. Stay with us in Montreal. of Santa International Drag Strip. Frank Bradley on the right would like to trade time slip with Joe Amato on the left. Amato's not having any of that because his has a W for win instead of L for lose. So Amato goes to the semifinals as round two action continues and here is the reigning Winston champion. Gary Ormsby executing that tire heating, crack heating burnout. Ormsby will be up against Eddie Hill, who you can see is backing up, has already done the burnout. Right now, let's go down to the starting line. Brock Gates and Don Garland's together. Guys? Well, Don, this is an interesting matchup. Uh, Gary Ormsby versus Eddie Hill. And Eddie a little bit off the mark as far as E.T. is concerned, but a lot of experience. And I would imagine, though, uh, Ormsby's got to be tough. Ormsby's running as strong today as I've seen him in a long time. He's got tough speed to meet at 279. But we got to remember one thing. Hill knows how to go four seconds. He just can't remember. Maybe he's remembered on this run. <laughs> well, it could be we're in for some interesting upsets here. That's the lane that the Greek was in, so let's watch. Huh? Yes, sir. This is the upset because, you know, anytime you have a delay in a race like this, it changes people's thinking. Well, Ormsby told me, guys, that Eddie Hill can have that lane. He feels that far lane has a little bump in it that disturbs his car. Gary Ormsby in the near lane right where he wants to be. A guy who raced for 25 years and finally achieved the ultimate, the Winston Championship in 1989. Eddie Hill, he's been racing even longer than Ormsby, and that is still his goal. He, his two chief, Buzz Carter, his wife, Jana, Eddie's wife, Ersie Thack, all that consumes them is winning that Winston title someday. But it won't be today. Eddie Hill loses traction even before the supposed bump. Gary Ormsby rockets to top speed of the event. 280 miles per hour, 5.12 seconds. Brock Yates is with his crew chief at the starting line, Lee Beard. Well, Lee, this racetrack seems to be running in pretty good. You're running into a direct headwind and still a 5.12. Got to make you feel pretty good. Uh, we're pretty pleased with that. Uh, that's a pretty competitive run. The speed's real good there at 280. We're really concerned with the racetrack. We don't want to overpower it. Uh, we're just taking it one round at a time here. Good. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. Lee Beard, Don Garlitz, had to be thrilled, though, to see that 280 miles per hour up on the board. Now, Shirley Muldowney and Frank Colley, the next combatants here, and we all know that speed doesn't win drag races, but it tells you a lot of things. Well, for one, she looks down and sees that speed on the board, and she knows that track will hold whatever Ron's going to give that engine right now. Two very interesting stories here. That is Frank Holly. There is Shirley Maldoni doing her burnout here at San Air, where she had a serious crash a few years ago. Frank Holly, wonderful story. Climbed into this automobile as a substitute for the injured Darrell Gwynn and won the first time out at Columbus, Ohio last week. And now let's go to Steve with Gary Hornsby. He had a fine run at 512. Yeah, I thought it was off a little bit. I, I thought maybe a little less than what we did before, but we had her a little soft. We didn't know what the track would be after this rain. Looks like we've got a good racetrack. 
Well, it is. It's an excellent racetrack. It took some more. <laughs> You'll give it some more, too. So, Gary, sure to be a major factor in the semis coming up. As we watch, Shirley Maldowney backing up, uh, getting ready for her face off against uh, Frank Holly. And what do you think, Don, between these two competitors? Well, I think Shirley's going to have to really step up, Brock. She only ran 524 in the first round to Holly's 510. And interestingly enough, she has great respect for Frank Holly after Daryl Gwynn's devastating accident in England. It was Shirley who first recommended Frank Holly as a driver for the family race car in the near lane. And what did he do? Won the very first time out, as Brock said earlier. But she might not have been too happy about that. No, maybe not. Shirley in the far lane, hoping to get out of the 520s and join Holly in the teens and maybe down into the O's with a motto. Good start, good race. But it's Holly on the top end, a big charge. He is around Shirley Muldowney at 511 to Shirley's 524. A good, strong run by Frank Holly, which will pair him up in the semifinals with Gary Ormsby. Frank Holly has lane charge with that low ET between the two of them. Joe Amato with a 507 low ET so far the event against the underdog of the day, the Greek Chris Karamasinas. Well, now let's paint the starting line a little differently. The sound will be very similar. Supercharged nitro burning engine. But the image of the race car is the silhouette completely different. The world's fastest bodied automobiles, NHRA's AA fuel funny cars. This is second round competition. And what a pair we got. Ed the Ace McCullough against Bruce Larson. Now, Larson comes into this round with a tremendous ET of 539 from the previous round. And McCullough only has a 558. But don't let that fool you. McCullough can step up. And remember, Larson's run was before the rain, which involved a nearly three-hour delay. So the setup is totally different for the Dauphin, Pennsylvania, defending Winston Champion against the man who has won twice so far this season, the Southerns and the Gators, Ed McCullough. There is his crew chief, Bernie Fredderly, guiding him into place. And now let's go to Steve with Frank Holly. Frank, you've had six rides now in the Gwen car and six victories. Well, we want to keep it like that for a couple more rounds. Uh, a couple you know, of more years. Well, a couple more rounds is all I really care about today. Ken and, and Gary and, and all the rest of the guys at Jerry have done an excellent job with the car. And, and uh, you know, when you drive in a car that's that powerful and, and that consistent, uh, the round wins are going to come. Indeed they are. Frank Holly, what a role he's on with this team. The references, of course, to Jerry and Ken. That's Jerry Gwynn, Daryl's father, who's here today, and Ken Benny, the crew chief, who's done such an excellent job with that car. Well, beautiful pairing we got coming up here. Going to be a really great race. Two great drivers, two great cars, but Larson has got to regain this championship point, so he's really going to be pushing it. But it's McCullough out first. Larson alongside Larson. Nose is McCullough out exactly what he had to do. You said it, Don. Get him out of that point earning capability. Let's go to the starting line with Gucci, Maynard Yanks. Great drag race, Maynard. He left beautifully and uh, just uh, ran real strong. Well, I think uh, he might have been a tad late, but uh, the car made up for it on the top. Uh, it's, it's, it's finally hitting a little consistent for us. Uh, the wind not bothering the car, apparently? No, it's moving around out there a little bit, but not a lot. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, Maynard said a tad late, and it didn't look like it was that bad to us, but it was terrible, as we can see by this replay. McCullough took a tremendous starting line advantage, and it looked to me like he was not going to be caught this afternoon. But down as we reached the finish line, something must have happened because Larson's power seemed to continue to build, and McCullough's engine kind of leveled off. And Larson just sticks a wheel right out in front of McCullough to take the win. Well, Bruce Larson saw a whole lot of that gold Oldsmobile before you finally got around him. I watched him the whole way down the track. I knew he was going to be tough this round, but that was a close one. You've got a little oil on the front of the motor. Is that a problem, do you think? I don't know. It looks like we might have pushed a seal out from under the intake manifold. I don't think it's anything serious because the car was pulling real strong at the end of the track. A 543, that's good. That's good. Yeah, we're happy with that. Okay, get it fixed. Thanks, Steve. Well, that could be more trouble than Bruce thinks. That is oil splattered all over the firewall of that funny car. As we watch the crew of Chris, the Greek Karamasin is getting ready for their semifinal run against Joe Amato. We'll be back with more from La Grande Nationale in Montreal right after this.
feet high and rise and here at San Air International drags to bounce out of Montreal. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Gates and Don Garland and there has been some rain the past few days. In fact, earlier today. But right now, the sky's a little cloudy, no moisture in the air and a good dry racetrack as we continue with the second round of funny cars at the Grand National Molson. In the near lane is Mark Oswald and in the far lane will be his opponent. That is Tom Hoover. Mark Oswald has been very, very consistent here this weekend. He hasn't been the fastest, but his times have been within just a couple of hundredths of each run, and that's what it takes to win drag racing this day and age. Tom Hoover, his opponent, being from Minnesota, these are the kind of conditions he actually enjoys. He likes a little humidity, a little moisture in the air. Maybe the track just a little bit slick, where a big gun like Oswald can't get a hold of it. He might just upset him at the finish line. And Don Garlitz is right. Mark Oswald and crew have found some consistency. They need to be consistently quicker, though. They just haven't been able to feed all the horsepower to the rear tires they would like to. Oswald near lane. Hoover far lane. A good start until Hoover gets sideways. Losing traction. Overpowers the racetrack. Mark Oswald will go to the semifinals. A 5.47. He's running just like a bracket car. Qualified with a 5.45. Run 5.49 in the first round. And now the 5.47. The only problem he's got is uh, Bruce Larson is running in the 5.30s. Well, he ain't faced Bruce Larson yet, so he's not worried about him. <laughs> well, that may be inevitable. You see the body coming down on the John Force automobile. His opponent will be K.C. Spurlock in the far lane. Spurlock, of course, won the opening race, the first race he ever ran on a Nigel Putnam car, the Winter Nationals in California back in February. One of the cars he had to beat was John Forrest, who you are now on board with. Let's quickly go to the starting line and get Brock and Don's thoughts on the Forrest versus Spurlock confrontation coming. Well, Don, this is kind of an interesting matchup. Of course, John Forrest is uh, running real strong, has been all season, but Casey Spurlock is a surprise. He's come on real well this season. Well, he's certainly the winningest rookie in NHRA history. But Force has been very steady. Qualified with a 542, run a 542 in the first round. And that's as good as anybody's running right now. If he can continue that type of performance, he will be hard to beat all day long. Spurlock, he could come up with a good run, but, you know, I don't anticipate that right now. Okay. Uh, do you think, uh, you think we got any difference in the lanes right now? No, the lanes are dead even. John Force has already had one confrontation today, and that was on the starting line in full view of everybody with his own crew chief, Austin Coyle. But they're kind of like siblings, you know? They have those rivalries, and they, they like to argue a little bit. Keeps everybody on edge, you know? You know John Force, you know what edge means. Now, K.C. Spurlock, Hendersonville, Tennessee, comes from a racing family. Sprint cars primarily, but he's chose the straightaway path. And done very, very well, surprisingly well, as we said earlier, the victor, the first time out ever in a funny car as we once again look through the windshield of John Force as he moves into position, Austin Coyle not shaking his fist at him there, just waving him into position, and we're ready for a start here at San Air. Spurlock, the beautiful yellow car, Force, the green and white car. You're on board with John Force. Where is Spurlock? He's behind by half a car length, but what a drag race. 540 to a 545. The big speed though belong to the loser, KC Spurlock, 260 miles per hour. Boy, when those two get together, it is never disappointing. John Forrest is driving through the shutdown area like a road racer, heating up his tires. <laughs> yeah, so when he makes a turnoff, he won't slip off into the ditch. <laughs> Beautiful start here on the two cars. Left almost dead even. But Force gains just a little bit in the initial race. And I'll tell you, that's what he needed because Spurlock's car began to come on at the very end and he runs 260 miles an hour, but it wasn't enough. You know, just before you turned off here, you made kind of a false turn at the guardrail. What were you doing? Oh, I was just checking out the front end, looking for you guys. <laughs> you found it. John Force getting ready to go into the semifinals. A big hog from KC Spurlock. Great drag race. We've got more of that coming up right after this. Welcome back to the NHRA La Grand National Molson from San Air Raceway outside Montreal, Quebec. I brought Gates along with Steve Evans and Big Daddy Don Garlitz. The scene here is the Gary Ormsby car being worked on. All calm, cool, and collected. Pretty normal work. Not so elsewhere. Let's go to Steve Evans. Well, Frank Hawley 
Gary's trouble-free operation here with the Gwen family has turned sour a bit, mechanically anyway. This is the engine he ran in the second round and ran so well with. It was fine. No smoke, no parts out of it until they checked the bearings. That's a black bearing, and it's not the worst one that came out of the engine. The crankshaft is blacker than the bearing, which is why they have had a transplant. You just can't run that kind of a crankshaft. Will that engine perform as well as the other one? They always say it will. We'll find out. What happens there is the oil fails to get to that bearing, and the bearing rubs against the crank, and that's metal to metal, and at 7,000 RPM, that makes a black crank. And one of the many reasons why these engines are torn down completely between races. As we go back to the starting line, this is the second round action here between funny cars. Jim White versus Chuck Etchells and Steve Evans, the Hawaiian car, one of the most famous of all in funny car competition. And right now it's got winner written all over it. You just can't quite see it yet. Jim White is just waiting and biding his time. He knows he can win without automobile. Chuck Etchells, well, he's felt that way the last six months. A businessman from Woodstock, Connecticut. Here's two guys that are just bound to win a race sooner or later. We just wait long enough, Don. Well, that Jim White, you think he would win one. He just has had so much bad luck. That's right, but he's got good luck right now. And he maintains it. He was off the mark first. He got to the finish line first at 553 to Etchell's 565. So that completes the pairings for the semifinal rounds here. And four of the best will go against each other. In the first pair, that is Jim White versus John Force. Force with a lane choice. The other pair, Mark Oswald and Bruce Larson. Larson with the lane choice as well in that pair. Going to be interesting. You know, here in Canada, especially French-speaking Canada and Quebec, driving is a little bit different. Earlier, Steve Evans had a look at what goes on on the road. In the province of Quebec, all road signs are in French by law. But you shouldn't have any problem if you use a little common sense. I mean, that sign, it's red. It's the same shape. Even though it says Adore, you're still going to S-T-O-P, right? One thing might freak you out at first, though, and that's direction signs. They're in French, as we said. But pretty easy to figure out. I mean, which looks more like north to you, Nord or Sioux? Well, if I was going to Quebec City, which is north of here, I'd follow that arrow. Now, est and west. Here's S. That's east, E-S-T. The T is silent. West, it's not on this sign. It's spelled O-U-E-S-T. But still, bonjour, monsieur. Pretty easy to figure out. So all in all, you really don't have to be Pepe La Pew to drive in Quebec. But which side of the road do you drive on? That's the question. Just like you do in the States, Yates. Well, the way I drive in the States, and big, we drive on the right-hand side. You just seem to drive either side you feel like. <laughs> Well, these guys don't have any choice. They have lanes that they're supposed to stay in. And we've got the second round of pro stock coming up here in two of the very best, Don. And this should be one of the best matchups in the second round because Ekman comes in with a 741 from the first round and Allen with a 742. Now, that means Allen's got to step up just a little bit because that one hundredth of a second makes a difference. And Ekman was a big winner at the Spring Nationals just one week ago on that Pontiac Trans Am. Now, Bruce Allen drives a Chevrolet Beretta. They're out of Arlington, Texas. Even though they're both General Motors products, tremendous rivalry between these teams, the Pontiac and the Chevrolet contingents. And as always, in, as in all pro stock competition, much of the race will be decided within the first wink of that green light. And you can bet that they're going to be right on their toes because, like we say, the race was even from the last round, so it's who gets off this starting line is who's going to win the race. They stage with these 500 cubic inch carbureted engines just screaming. And with that kind of start, it's going to be horsepower and good shifting that's going to win the race. And it's Jerry Ekman. He won the race at 735 to Allen 740. Just sensational pro stock competition. The two yellow cars, well, now there's only one coming back, and that is Jerry Ekman. By watching this replay, I don't believe Ekman trusted Allen because not only did he take a starting line advantage, but that car moved exceptionally well in the first three or 400 feet, and it didn't seem like it was gonna be possible for Bruce Allen to make it up, and make it up he did not. Ekman continued to gain the lead and took the race handily. Boy, Bruce Allen yells, good run, Jerry. I'll say it was a good run, a 7.35. Wow, that was good, it was, <laughs> thanks, Bruce. Yeah, that was a good run, I was happy. We, uh, 
got here and ran real well in qualifying, and we've been stumbling ever since. It's good to be back on track, so. You were the low qualifier. You got a big bonus earlier today. I counted 13 crew members on the starting line to accept that check. You need it just to buy shirts. Yeah, we really do. Uh, this uh, this second round win will help uh, maybe buy lunch for this crew. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people is apparently paying off. At Columbus, you made that transmission change at the last minute and saved you. Yeah, it sure did. Uh, we've been real fortunate this year. We're just thrilled to death to even be in this position. Thrilled to Thank talk you. to you again. So Jerry Eklund moves on here at Santa Ana as we get ready for the next pairing of pro stock competitors. This man, Ricky Smith, always tough, always in the hunt, but has never been a victor in a major event. As we watch this man who has won repeatedly, Warren Johnson, in that very, very potent Oldsmobile. I will tell you one thing, and I think Don Garlitz will agree, this year, Ricky Smith has been the most outstanding driver off of the starting line. His reaction times have just been phenomenal, and you know, they never cease. He seemed like, and it's rattled a lot of his competitors from time to time. That's right. When you go up against this man from King, North Carolina, it's to the point now, you just assume he's going to leave first, and you better outpower him. And outpower them is what Warren Johnson specializes in. From Duluth, Georgia, with the Oldsmobile, well over 1,000 horsepower in these Pro Stock engines. Notice how carefully these cars stage. They used to just jump in. Now they're very careful. They don't try to overstage. They need every inch of rollout because they leave so hard, they will red light if they don't have all of that rollout. No overstaging in this game. Oh, absolutely not. But it just amazes me the engines stay together as high as they bring up the RPMs. Both drivers being very cautious here. No mind game, I don't think. They're just being careful. Did you know, Steve, when the last car turns on the stage, both cars go to full throttle. And Ricky Smith just abuses Warren Johnson off the starting line. Oh, Johnson did not have enough to come back from that hole shot. Smith wins 739. Johnson loses quicker 737. And we see it all right here. Look at Smith make his move. Johnson had the fastest and the quickest car in this race. How disappointing that must be to the crew. He could not catch Ricky Smith. He did it, and he won it on the starting line. Remember, your clock doesn't start till your wheels leave the beam. Smith, 7.39, a .44 light. Johnson, a 7.37, but a .50 light. The reaction made the difference for the man in the orange suit. Ricky Smith will go to the semifinals in pro stock. I'm Brock Gates, along with Big Daddy Don Garlitz and Steve Evans, back at the La Grand National Molson outside Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And do the French Canadians like drag racing? Are they having a good time? You can bet on it. And I'll tell you, they're very knowledgeable drag racing fans. A lot of them touring the pits, watching this kind of action. Crew Chief Maynard Yank, well, he saw the oil on the front of Bruce Larson's engine. He took a closer look and changed motors. That was a lot worse than anybody thought at the end of the racetrack. There's the dead player. It was a little bit more than a gasket, wasn't it, Steve? Yeah, they always kind of say that, hoping for the best. All right, you're on board with the best. Bob Glidden as the second round of Pro Stock continues. His Ford Probe now in reverse. As he backs up, he'll be awaiting his opponent, the young Ohio driver, double tough, Mark Powick. In fact, he's the world record holder for a lap's time, but can't seem to win a championship. And I got an idea Glidden's going to be plenty tough, too, because he wants to recover from that Columbus fiasco when he didn't qualify. Just last week, Bob Glidden failed to qualify. A hush fell over the entire Midwest, especially the state of Indiana. Mighty Casey had struck out. From Medina, Ohio, right outside Cleveland, Mark Pollock getting ready to go in that very potent Oldsmobile of his. And from Whiteland, Indiana, the pride of Indiana, Bob Glidden. It's amazing that Bob Glidden is the only Ford in all of pro stock. Others have tried it, including Ricky Smith, has never been able to make it work. Bob Glidden just has the secret to this particular combination. Plus, he's got a lot of perseverance. He doesn't give up on a project when he gets started on it. He follows it through. That's right. He's one with Chevrolet's, he's one with Chrysler's, and he's one with Ford's. And you're about to feel, well, not quite feel, but at least see the release of the clutch and all the gear changes as Bob Glidden and Mark Powell duke it out. Glenn wins it. Just barely. They left together. They almost finished together. A 738 to a 741. You can see now why we call Pro Stock the closest racing of them all. This is what the fans came to see. Dead even start. Too close to call. They run wheel to wheel down the track. 
But right at the very end, Bob Glidden begins to develop just a little bit more horsepower and begins to take an advantage. Not much, but enough to win the race. Bob Glidden is having a much more enjoyable weekend in Montreal than you did in Columbus, Ohio. It was a little dreadful last week, Steven. Not qualifying, uh, you bet. Well, you know, things like that happen, and uh, so far it's been a lot better here. You know, and your son Billy said, we're not going to change the car. It was ready in Columbus conditions. Did us. 7.38 here, nice one. Well, you know, we did make our first run, the 7.35 qualifying run, the way we left Columbus. So uh, it was just a matter of circumstances. You got it, going to the semifinals. So a little congratulatory handshake from the two competitors as we get ready for more second round pro stock action. And this is the only Chrysler product in the field. Daryl Alderman's Dodge against Larry Morgan's very potent Oldsmobile. And the same thing applies here that Don mentioned earlier with Bob Glidden. Sheer dedication on the part of the Alderman team makes them competitive with the likes of Larry Morgan. With three wins this season, and of course, his biggest thrill winning the NHRA U.S. Nationals in 89. Daryl Alderman, well, in 1989, he had three wins. The Dodge fans were crazy about that, and he finished in the top ten, in fact, fifth in Winston Point. So Alderman and Morgan, Alderman... If you look across two years, let's say, is the better lever off the starting line. Morgan seems to take it very carefully and use big horsepower. Well, he's going to need some big horsepower because Daryl Alderman's 500 cubic inch 440 Dodge really makes some muscle. Yes, it does, but not as consistently as they would like. Dodge versus Oles. That's the Oles on the far lane, the green and white third, Larry Morgan. Oh, who wins it? Electronically, it's Judge Daryl Alderman. Alderman runs a 7.35, but Morgan had the best reaction time of his life, runs a 7.40 and makes it look like a dead heat. What a starting line advantage Morgan takes. He was figuring on some horsepower out of that dodge, so he figured he's going to have to make it right at the starting line. And he took a lead that was unbelievable. I bet Alderman watched his car halfway down the track before he started to pull ahead. Right about there, the Dodge starts to make a move. And he gets out in front just by a whisker to win the race. I'm sure I won't have to tell Daryl Alderman how close that one was. That was a close race. Larry's always real close, Steve. Even closer than the elapsed times might indicate it. You're 35 to his 40. Yeah, he, he must have got me a little bit on the starting line then. 35. Those numbers could win this race. Yeah, I hope we can run a 35 throughout the race. Maybe we will be in the winter circle. We'll couple that up with some good reaction times, and uh, you will be. <laughs> okay. Darrell Alderman, the smiler. Well, that marks the end of second round competition here in Pro Stock at San Air and sets the field for the semifinals. Jerry Ekman versus Bob Litton. Ekman with Elaine Choice in the Pontiac Trans Am. The other pair, Ricky Smith in another Pontiac versus Daryl Alderman's Dodge. Alderman with the lane choice following that great race against Larry Morgan. When you first hit the Canadian four lanes, boy, are your eyes going to light up at the sight of that sign. 100. But before you mash the pedal down, that's 100 kilometers per hour, or kilometers, or as Brock Yates likes to say, well-traveled automotive journalist that he is, collects. Now, any late model car, if you look inside the mile per hour scale on your speedometer, you'll find a kilometer scale. But if you just can't deal with the metric stuff, use the Evans formula. Multiply that one by six. 60 miles per hour, approximately 100 kilometers per hour. And we found out here that if you're running 100 clicks, you're probably holding up traffic. They do like to roll in Canada. Let's carry this formula thought a bit further. You'll find most of Canada's lovely rural two-lane roads posted at 80 clicks. Now, using the Evans system, that's approximately 48 miles per hour. Okay, now for the next one, you're on your own. <laughs> well, those uh, excellent reports recorded earlier by our driving expert here in Quebec, Steve Evans, uh, obviously. He'll be back along with us for more action from San Air. Top Fuel coming up. You're looking at the very active pit area of funny car driver John Forrest and all's well in the engine department and the relationship department. John and crew chief Austin Coyle, they seem to be getting along just fine, as opposed to maybe a little earlier this morning where tensions, uh, well, were rather hot. 
I'm Steve Evans. Let's go down to the starting line and join Brock Yates and Don Garland. Well, Don, Holly Ormsby, uh, two former world champions, very poised drivers, excellent race cars, almost identical ETs. What do we do now? Well, I think that uh, Ormsby's definitely got an advantage going into this round because the Holly team over there changed an engine. They had some mechanical difficulties, and that's always a little bit of a kind of a handicap. Right. Although sometimes they'll change an engine, and I know you've done it, and not run real strong, so you can never tell. It, it does put an unknown factor into it. The first of two races in the semifinals of Top Duel here at San Air International Drag Strip, the Grand National Molson. And I tell you, I have to agree with Don Garland on this call. Anytime you have to change engines, as the Holly crew did, it can be, if nothing else, distracting. You always tell the announcer, oh, they're all the same. They're never the same. That's right. Everyone has its own personality. And Orsby has been awfully cool today. Lee Beard has been doing a terrific job. It's just one of those situations where I think it's, it's a handicap. And there's Jerry Gwen bringing in Frank Holly. He glances over at the Ormsby car, notices that it's hitting on all eight cylinders, appears perfect, but so does the power plant for Holly as well. They've done a good job. And one thing Holly did with Lane Joyce put Ormsby over in that far lane that he doesn't particularly like because of that bump he's in. That's right. Every one of the fuel cars has been lifting the wheels just a little bit going over that bump. And let me tell you, that concerns the drivers especially on these top-of-the-line cars. And with a lot of headwind to boot. What a drive by Gary Ormsby. Low elapsed time of the entire event, 505. Resets his own top speed mark to 281 miles per hour. Holly, as good as he ran, 516 was never even in it. That is Joe Amato getting ready to go in the second pairing of the top fuel semifinals here as uh, the crew chief right behind him, Tim Richard, working on that engine, making the final adjustments. That's the Greek, the underdog here, the decided underdog, uh, Don Garlitz. Do you know, Brock, that this is the first NHRA national event that the Greek has ever been in the semifinals? I bet his heart is thumping like a young Robin's breast. <laughs> Well, it'll be interesting to see because he's going to get a legitimate test here against the former world champion, Joe Amato. So if the Greek can put him away, he's on his way to some great things. Could be the upset of the year in the making. And now let's go to Steve at the far end. Well, Gary Ormsby certainly just proved something to everyone, racer and fan alike. Not only is this racetrack very good, but as the day cools off, these cars are going to run quicker. A 5-0-5, low elapsed time of the event. It felt real good, and we tuned her up like we said last time. We tuned her up a little bit. We knew we had a tough hombre next to us there, and we tuned her up a little bit for that round. You've got to be hoping that 05 will give you lane choice. We really do. You don't like that left lane. No, I think the right lane is a little better, although we just went down at 5-0-5. What are you going to say? You want to stay there. Yeah, who knows? I'll let Lee make that decision. You get used to that bump now. You and it are friends. Yeah, as long as I run 505, I'll take the bump. Does that bump bother the extra as much as a funny car? Do you think they're the ones that complain the most about it? I, I don't think so, Steve. I, I don't even feel it myself. Uh, I know it's there. The car feels feel it. Yeah. Gary Ornsby, what a shot. Oh, it's going to be a good one as the speeds get quicker here. The Greek now ready to go against Joe Amato. What do you think, Don Garlitz? Well, this ought to be some kind of a race. I, you know, if I was just sitting in the cockpit and I was Joe Amato, I would think to myself, this is an easy one, and I'd already be thinking ahead to the time that I was going to turn for lane choice with Orange. The Greek smokes the tires. Amato breaks up, and the Greek gets back on the pedal. Chris Karamazinis recovers to upset Joe Amato. It is Bedlam on the starting line. Brock is there with crew chief Lance Larson. Lance, I'll tell you what, what a courageous ride. Uh, the man stayed in it all the way, huh? That's him. <laughs> I know that. He does it for us all the time. I mean, he's got 35 years of experience. His first NHRA final, I couldn't be happier for him. He never gave up, did he? He just he stayed with He never gives it. up. He yeah. doesn't even know how to do that. <laughs> I bet that. What an excited crew, and I don't blame him. For the first time in his career, the Greek is in the final. He goes against Gary Ormsby. Ormsby has lane choice. Let's go to Steve with Chris. Right, you smoked the tires, you stayed with it. Yeah, well, anything goes at the last run. Get Can it. you spell the word lift, L-I-F-T? <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> it's a shame. I used to do it, but not anymore. I mean, I didn't, never did, now I should do it now. That's why. Why quit now? Right? <laughs> What can you do for the final? Can you tangle with Ormsby? You saw his 505. I think we just play with the clutch a little. We might be all right. Oh, boy. 
What a sentimental figure that man's gonna be. Hello, Chicago. Boy, if he pulls this one off, they'll be rocking and rolling on the loop. I'll guarantee you that. And now, let's go back to our man on the road, Steve AAA Evans, for more reports on driving in Canada. Oops, you caught me. I shouldn't even have this rascal out, because I just found out that, like the province of Ontario, radar detectors are illegal in Quebec. Now, how would the federality know if you had one? Well, I guess when they shine the radar on you and you slam on the brakes, pretty good chance. If they find it in Quebec, they fine you about $40. If you're in Ontario, well, they have radar detector detectors. They know for sure you have it, and they take it away from you, and they don't give it back. So my advice would be, considering the speed limits are fairly high and law enforcement very reasonable, leave it home or lock it in the trunk. That's what I'm going to do. A word to the wise. What else has he got in the trunk? Don't even ask, folks. Be sure to stay tuned right after this for the NHRA Today, coming up next on TNN. Right now, though, we'll be back with more drag racing from Canada. Back at the NHRA Grand National Molson, it is time for the Pro Stock Semifinals. And a couple of interesting competitors. The Dodge of Daryl Alderman up against the Pontiac of Ricky Smith. Usually, you would refer to both of these drivers as kind of whole-shot artists. But they've both got performance to win with today, Don Garlitz. I still got to give the whole shot, though, to Ricky Smith. He just is so good on that starting line. I've got an idea that Alderman is planning on driving around him. Well, we're about to find out. 2,350 pounds. They look just like the Dodge or the Pontiac that you might be driving. NHRA, make sure of that. Oh, wheels in the air. What a semi. Alderman with power. 732, 184 miles per hour. But Donnie also left the starting line first. Alderman did. That sometimes happens, you know, when you're racing somebody that you know is real good. You really push those lights. And that's just exactly what Bob Glidden's going to have to do right now. He comes into this round with a performance disadvantage of 738 to Ekman 735. He needs a starting line advantage. A little unusual for Glidden, who is uh, in the middle of a little bit of a slump, as opposed to Ekman, who's running very strong, very hot streak for him. And now, let's go down to the other end with Steve Evans and Daryl Alderman. You know, when you get to this point in elimination, Daryl, do you as a driver, we hear Ricky Smith leaving behind us as you have chopped him to pieces. Do you as a driver get a lot more comfortable in the car as the rounds progress? Oh, definitely. The first round's always the toughest round for me. And then as the rounds go on, you get more comfortable in the car. And your reaction time's improved. Yours do, anyway. Yeah, same too. Well, congratulations. Low ET of the event. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. All right, today winding down, uh, beginning to get just a little bit dark here as uh, he heads back to the pits. We'll be watching for the results of this uh, race between Ekman and Glidden. Board in the far lane. Pontiac in the near lane. The Pontiac of Ekman is away first. Jerry Ekman in the near lane shows Bob Glidden no mercy whatsoever. A tenth of a second hole shot and then beats him with a 7.33 to a 7.36. Jerry Ekman goes to the final round. And it'll be General Motors versus Chrysler. The Daryl Alderman Dodge Daytona versus Jerry Ekman's Pontiac Trans Am. Alderman has the lane choice. But before we go back to racing, let us return to the highways of Quebec and our man on the road, Steve Evans. Having logged many miles north of the border, I know you, too, are going to enjoy your Canadian highway adventures. Until, that is, you get to the petrol pump. Good fuel is over 60 cents per liter. Approximately 3.7 liters per U.S. gallon. That's well over $2.50 Canadian currency. A little less in U.S. funds, but still pretty pricey fuel. My advice is fill up and top it off before you cross the border and run her home lean and mean. Why do you think you see so many Canadian plates at filling stations on the U.S. side? Well, you think Canadian gas is expensive? How about this stuff that Chris Garamasinas is dumping into his tank? That's nitro, 30 bucks a gallon. And when you run on Chris's budget, you don't spill a drop. Chris Garamasinas is preparing for his first ever NHRA Top Fuel final round. Back at Santa Air International Drag Strip, Playground National Molson, Gary Ornsby and Pooch.
Chief Lee Beard and the red sweatshirt warm up that top fuel engine just to make sure that every nut, bolt, and fuel line has been put back in the right place. There'll be no leaks in the starting line when he gets ready for the final round in top fuel. But right now we have to accomplish the semifinals in the funny car category. And it's starting to get well, just a little bit on the dark side. And of course the program running late because almost two and a half to three hours really was lost earlier today due to rain right during first round competition. So actually NHRA racers, everybody working together to try to get this thing done before nightfall. The fans love to see them at night. The drivers don't necessarily like to drive them at night. Not at the speeds they're running these days. Well, the first semifinal in funny guard Bruce Larson and Mark Oswald what do you say we go back down to the starting line and get the opinions up? Well, two real experts on motorsports, Big Daddy, Don Garland, and Brock Gates. Who do you think they'll pick, Bruce Larson or Mark Oswald? A couple of very strong runners, Larson and Oswald. Uh, uh, you call it. Well, a previous round, the ETs are almost identical, Brock. It's too close to call. It's going to be a question of who gets off that starting line first. So what we've got is an even racetrack and two even cars and two even drivers, huh? Yeah, with well, the Larson, you know, he is so determined to get back into the hunt for the world championships. I'm sure he's going to be squeezing it. Well, I can't believe that, folks. Neither of the guys would go out on the left here. I'll tell you the truth, I won't either. I, I totally agree. The only thing maybe going against Larson is that engine change, but you, you just never know. They might have a better bullet in the trailer than the one they took out. And one thing I have to add about an engine change, it also includes a clutch change, and that is really the big problem because a new clutch doesn't hardly ever respond the same as a used one. Here's Larson in the near lane. He is the reigning Winston Funny Car champion. Mark Oswald held that title in the past. It is Oswald. Oswald over that bump, smokes the tires, and still holds on. Leonard Hughes says, that's my boy. Mark Oswald, 543, his best. 268 miles per hour, and a whole shot to go with it. Well, we had two very evenly matched cars, but unfortunately, the driver of one of them was late, or that new clutch didn't respond properly. Anyway, it gave Oswald a definite starting line advantage, and that's all he needed to win this race. You can see Larson does well going down course, but Oswald's car is very definitely out front. Just a bit more than a car length difference at the end of the drag strip. You can see the difference in the reaction time and the almost identical ETs. Well, drag racers, Mark, have always called the starting line advantage a whole shot. That was a hole you could drive an 18-wheeler through. Well, I'm just glad we put this probe in the final. This is a first week for our 90 car, and we're real happy to be here. You ran a 43 to his 42. Some good driving. Yeah, that was just a good race. Ours had the wheels up a couple times, and it was shaking a little bit, so it was a handful. The wheels are up, and you know that by the feel or by the horizon changing? or what? It's a little bit of both. You can feel it. You feel the, the tension off the steering wheel, and the horizon starts to disappear. Important to keep that wheel straight so that when they touch down, that's the direction you're going? Yeah, it is. We were fortunate. It made it right down the middle there. Good job. Thanks. Okay, let's go back to the starting line for the second pairing in the funny car semifinals, and it's going to be an interesting one. Jim White versus John Force. And the Force has really been something to be reckoned with this season, Don Garland. Force has ran very consistent, and he's been very consistent at this race. And White, now White ran a 538 in qualifying, but he has not performed like that on race day, not, not even once. So I got an idea that Force is really the, the, the power here. The body up of the Force car, Austin Coyle always does that to uh, add the wires to the second Magneto. You know, and Austin Coyle spent a whole lot of John Force's money testing this car. As Force said earlier this year, he left a trail of molten aluminum from Michigan to California. But here's where it has paid off. They are starting to win races. You bet Roland Leong, the crew chief over on the Hawaiian car, has certainly reached into the bag and tried to get that combination for that earlier 538 I told you about. But this is what he's going to need to beat Force, because he comes in with a 540 from the round before. Look at Force, a little twitchy on the wheel. Gets a hold of the brake, holding that car. Force finally stages Force and White. Great start, John Force driving that car as straight as it can be done. 
and John Forrest drives it right into the final round with a 546 at 267 miles per hour. The testing that that team did earlier this year, as I said, is paying off in a big, big way. White takes a beautiful starting line advantage. He really wanted to get John, but the power began to fall off as he went down course, and he didn't run as well as he ran the round before. And you can see Forrest's car just building distance all the way down. Takes the win handily from Jim White. Okay, that sets up the uh, funny car final. John Forrest versus Mark Oswald, Oswald Lane Choice. Let's go to Steve. John, I'm starting to lose count of how many finals you've been in this year, and you're headed into another one. What a season. Starting to make me real nervous. Uh, she trucked out there pretty good, and I seen that old punch bowl come around me, and I had to step off the gas for a second, and she shook me hard, and it recovered and drove around me, but obviously you had some trouble. What'd she run? Uh, she ran a 46. You've lost lane choice to Mark Oswald. Well, I was beginning to wonder if that other lane was better, but uh, we're excited, and it's uh, doing what we thought he'd do, and Give it to my guys. They did a good job. Well, Gary Ornsby's 505 tells you that lane has got to be pretty good. 505 in the right lane. In the left-hand lane. Well, we'll take it either way. Maybe my crew chief there just overpowered her a little. Maybe so. And you know he'll give it everything he's got, whichever lane. We'll be back for all the Pro Class Finals right after this. drag racing all night you better build your drag strip in the summertime somewhere near alaska because here in montreal sooner or later it's going to get dark with all the rain delays that may happen here at the grand national molson all that's left are the finals and first up is pro stock somebody pick a winner here brock don please well go ahead don you got the it's your turn well it's real hard to do because alderman comes into the round with a 732 ekman comes in with a 733 that's almost too close to call now, they both are excellent on the lights. They're going to leave together, or one might even get a red light if he tries to squeeze the tree too hard. Now, Don, you've always been a Dodge man, you know? I'm proud of you. You're showing a lot of integrity here. I call them like I see them. You <laughs> always have, my friend. It is the Dodge in the near lane, the bright yellow Pontiac from California, Jerry Ekman over in the far lane. And I agree with my pals here. Flip a coin on this one. May the best driver win. Buster Couch up there saying, guys, let's get staged up here. Have you noticed we can start to see the stars? Huh? Well, at least we'll be able to see Ekman's car. It's bright yellow. Alderman's, well, he's red and white. Going to blend into the uh, crowd here, the landscape. This is really starting to get real dark. Here we go. We're ready. Pro Stock Final. RPM's up. This is for all the money in the Winston points. It's a great start. It's a great race. Jerry Ekman, 7.32 to a 7.35, even though Alderman maybe got away first. We'll look at the replay in a bit. But it's Ekman going to the winner's circle for the second consecutive NHRA national event. Alderman, in fact, did get away first. He took a nice starting line advantage, and it looked like if he had a maintained the performance that we'd seen earlier, he would have been an easy winner. But something happened right about here in the race course, and Alderman's car fell off just a little bit. And that's all that Ekman needed to put his car out in front. They both ran the same speed, 186 miles an hour. But that little distance that Ekman picked up allowed him to win the race by inches. Jerry Ekman saying, did I win that? I tell you what, Steve, that had to be close. Continue the thought. It was close, huh? Oh, boy, you don't know. No, I know. We wouldn't be here if you didn't win. Oh, great. What, what can I say, Steve? This is, makes two in a row, like I said before here. There's a lane on each side of the track, and we got one of them, and I guess it was good enough to get down the track. I got to thank my sponsors, Pennzoil Pontiac, John Waldy at Stratford Motor Products, is our home track here in uh, Canada. What can I'm excited. Our owner, Bill Orndor, is pretty excited, too, and all yeah, 13 of those shirts. Yeah, uh, I got to say hello to Bill and thank him for all his good decisions. Dale Ike, Tom Levin, the whole group. What can I say? Can all your life, you've dreamed of a season like this. Do you have to pinch yourself every once in a while? Well, I guess I'm just lucky, Steve. I guess I'm just lucky. Yeah, I mean, good. Well, I, I guess that comes with it. Luck is something that uh, you make for yourself, I guess, and it looks like we've worked hard enough to get it, so here we are. Added that Winston points lead, you've got a Columbus. Oh, man, I, I'm excited. I'm excited. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't you know. said it all. Man, I have
Welcome back to San Air International Dragway outside of Montreal, Quebec, Canada, in the Lake Run National Molson. You know, while we were away, something truly incredible happened. You remember how dark it was? We were operating, unbeknownst to us, under an almost total eclipse of the sun. Suddenly, the eclipse was over. It got so bright, it scared the fans. They all ran off into the woods. The racers escaped under the cover of darkness. I'm going to get out of this gig. What happened was it got too darn dark to run the top fuel and funny car final, so this is tomorrow and a whole new set of conditions. It's very cold. NHRA trying to put heat in the racetrack with their jet track dryer. The racers warming up their engines two and three times. More importantly, though, how does a 12-hour delay affect this? We asked the funny car finalists, John Force and Mark Oswald. Mark, on the surface anyway, you would seem to be the guy that could handle the 12-hour delay better than John Force. Maybe a little calmer kind of a driver. Oh, I don't know about this. It's been a long race here. You know, we're just happy to be in the final. Uh, John gets pretty hyped up. Uh, sometimes you need that to win a race. Uh, today here, the racetrack's a, a lot cooler. The conditions are different. It's just going to be whoever gets to the other end first, I think. What was your evening like last night? Long. Uh, couldn't sleep, uh, ate late. We were out here and actually got up early this morning feeling rather good and come out and I've been walking the track for about an hour. And after that interview, John and Austin Coyle walked the track one more time. They did not have lane choice. And they knew without asking Oswald that they would be in the near lane because of this occurrence last evening in the alcohol final. Paul Johnson in the far lane, the white car. Bob Newberry, a real quality competitor in the near lane, but his engine failed and Newberry lubricated the near lane from starting line to finish line with oil. So today, Mark Oswald has put John Force in the near lane, the lane that was oiled down for this all-important funny car final, Don Garland. But I do have to say that that gave NHRA a lot of time last night to clean that lane up. It wouldn't surprise me if the lane isn't better than the other lane. In fact, I told John if he got that lane last night when they were cleaning it up to just pull over a little bit and it would be just fine. Run a little out of the groove intentionally? Yes. You know, Big, I want to be your agent. We'll open a little booth back at the pit that says Big Daddy Speaks or something. Let's start selling this information. You're giving it away. Sounds like a good idea, Steve. <laughs> Just kidding, folks. Oh, and the iron he is, Mark Oswald is the one that loses traction. John Forrest, a marvelous job of driving. 540, 267 miles an hour in the lane that was thought to be inferior. Well, just like I told you, the lane was all right after they cleaned it up. So John Force, he kept his cool. He made a beautiful start, took a starting line advantage, pulled over just a little bit to the right as he got down course. You can see, blew a little dust on the edge of the track. There was rice ash blowing around his headers over. You can see it. And moved down there just fine with a 540. A very good time. As good a time as he had run earlier in the race. And now he's the champion. Let's go down with Steve who's with John right now. I have to tell you, this was a joint effort on the part of a fine driver and a great crew chief because this was a brand new racetrack, right, John Forrest? Brand new racetrack, it was good. Coyle and I, we walked it for about an hour and we was looking around and, and Garland said last night, he told Coyle, obviously you gotta leave the start line and drive her over on the fence and stay out of that groove if you can in the deal. And Coyle said, yeah, that might put you up against the wall, but it worked just like driving an old diesel truck, huh? <laughs> Good job, Austin. And we, we got to thank Steve Gibbs and the safety safari crew for doing one hell of a job of fixing that oil down lane and prepping the track here in the mist this morning. Yeah, they did a fine job. But how about this guy? You guys fight a lot, but you can't today. This guy's the best there is, but I'm tired of telling him his head gets too big. <laughs> is that true, John? Hey, fight a lot. You should have been there first round to get Dench yesterday when we had the big Duke out and Coyle quit on the start line. I said, you can't quit me. You ain't even paid yet. <laughs> All right, some real celebration on the John Force team. No doubt about that. But we've got one more race left. The top fuel final. Chris, the Greek Karamasinis, and Gary Hornsby. Earlier, Steve talked with both of these veterans. Well, I think if we weren't running for the champions, Steve, I, I don't even know if I'd even go to the starting line. I just let the Greek have it. He's been racing for 30-plus years, and he's never won a national event. But we got to go up there and try to beat the guy because we are running for the world championship. And it's people like the Greek that keep a lot of racers going. That's for sure. You know, he's been an inspiration to me. He was racing probably 10 years before I started, and I've been racing quite a few years. And he was always my hero back then, and now here I am facing him in the final. 
You know, Greg, to many people in this sport, old and young, you are the spirit of drag racing. If you win, they'll share vicariously in it. Well, I think that uh, that might be a nice thing, right, for all of us? You hear that sound in the background? That's the man that wants to take this first victory away from you, Gary Ormsby. He doesn't want to, but he has to if he can. Is that right? Maybe I should go talk to him. Maybe we can work a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Is that man laid back or what? There he is, the Greek, Chris Caramassini's in that beautiful new red dragster, and it's a good car, right, Don Garlitz? Yes, it is. It's running as good as it ever ran. He's got a good team. You know they've sent him to the line. He's ready. Third stage, the final battle of this long weekend. The Greek and Ormsby. Ormsby stretches it out on the far end and is the champion today. 520, 277 miles per hour for Gary Ormsby. As we watch the replay, I just have to figure that uh, Ormsby wasn't going to cut the Greek any slack. Look at that starting line advantage he takes. And then another thing, the Greek probably softened the clutch up pretty good, you know. Didn't trust that track, figured it was going to be a little damp. But the track fooled him when Austin Coyle caused that car to go down with a 540. We had a track. And you know, he took that near lane. For the first time in the 1990 season, Gary Ormsby leads the Winston points chase with that win light over the great. Great job. Oh, it's a good sound, Steve. It's been a pretty uh, exciting weekend, really, you know, with all the adverse weather and everything. And when you're glad to put behind you at this point. That's for sure. Tell me about your thoughts at the starting line. It was misting. You had your hero in the other lane. What was going through your mind? Well, you know, like I said earlier, if I... If it wasn't for the world championship, I'd have just, just shut it off and let that guy win this race, you know? He's a great guy, and... Were you concerned, though, that maybe you'd overpower the track and he wouldn't? We certainly were. We were really, in fact, it spun the tires out there, and I had to back out of it, and we were real concerned about that. Well, you had to lift somewhere in the racetrack? Oh, yeah, I had to back out of it. Without without getting off the throttle, it might have smoked the tire. It could have. It could have. It was spinning them. I don't know if it was smoking them. It was spinning them. And the points lead is yours. You've been waiting a long time for that. That's great. Thank you. Did you ever see him at all? No, I didn't. No, I don't even know what happened to him. He was there. Yep. A great, great drag race to cap the long and difficult weekend here as the Greek takes his helmet off. An honorable defeat by all means. A great show by a great veteran. And our congratulations to all the winners here at Lake Grand National Molson in Montreal, Quebec. Gary Ormsby, John Forrest, Jerry Eckman. Well done, gentlemen. For Don Garlitz and Brock Yates, I'm Steve Evans. Thanks for joining us. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Palish. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by this special offer from Diamond B. For seven seasons, Diamond P Sports award-winning American Sports Cavalcade series on TNN has brought you a wider variety of motorsports than any other and with more cameras than you normally see. And it's because of the talented people who man these viewfinders, Diamond P has been able to produce an exciting new video entitled, And They Walked Away. Incredible crashes from stock car racing, motocross, IMSA and SEC road racing, NHRA drag racing, Eastern modifieds, even swamp buggies, and more. To get your copy of And They Walked Away, send $24.95 plus $3.50 shipping and handling to the address on your screen. Or better yet, call 1-800-453-9300. These and MasterCard accepted no CODs. Call now, 1-800-453-9300. American Sports Cavalcade is a presentation of Diamond P Sports.